Welcome back to Ball Talk. I'm Tom Ackerman. Great to have you with us. The St. Louis chapter of the Baseball Writers Association presents this. And as you'll experience throughout your subscription, Ball Talk is special, not only because of our amazing collection of writers, but it's the only podcast in all of professional sports presented by and co-hosted by competitive members of the print media in the same market. And we invite some very special guests as well. It's Ball Talk, ensuring the tradition of sports journalism excellence that it continues. Well, in the first two episodes of Ball Talk, we had uh, some of the young guns in the industry. Katie Wu, Ben Fredrickson, Zach Silver. Uh, We also uh, heard from Russ Dorsey. He was really good. Uh, Jeff Jones. We've had a great group. Now we're bringing in uh, some of the guys that have been uh, doing it as long as I have in radio. And uh, it's great to, to be along with some of the veterans in the industry. A great pleasure to bring in some leaders in baseball journalism. Let me start with my friend, Derek Gould of the Post-Dispatch. He has been on the beat for quite a while. He's been in St. Louis for a long time. And you know, you sit in a chair as lead baseball writer for the Post-Dispatch that has been full of Hall of Famers. I think we're talking about over a century of Hall of Famers. J. Roy Stockton, Bob Bragg, Rick Hummel. No pressure, Mr. Gould, but uh, I think you're well on your way myself. Yeah, uh, Hummel likes to remind me of that daily, right? You know, that. Uh, <laughs> the, no. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it speaks to the rich history of baseball in town, and part of that is the uh, – having the, the people who write about it. Um, you know, you're right. It was, uh, it was something that, um, that I looked up not too long. Well, I guess uh, now about five, six years ago, but when Hummel was getting used, uh, was getting close to a bunch of milestones, this is his 50th year um, writing for the paper, um, you know, which is just remarkable. And then of course this year you have Dick Cagle going in um, and getting the, uh, the BBWA award for, for meritorious service and for a lifelong commitment to baseball writing there in Cooperstown. So you know, that adds another layer to uh, the post-dispatch roll call at Cooperstown. Absolutely. Um, it, it's great to always talk to you. You and I go back a long ways, and I can't wait to talk some ball with you here. And then the only person who goes back further, I think, in, in your business is Ryan Fagan. I mean, I, I've, I've known Fagan. I feel like you and I grew up together. Uh, we've yeah. known each other since the start of this. And I'm very proud of your work as well at the Sporting News. In fact, your recent story about uh, the Baseball Writers Association of America removing the J.G. Taylor Spink uh, name uh, was a a big one. Can you tell us about how that came about? Yeah, well, obviously, J.G. Taylor Spink uh, was the publisher of the Sporting News from 1914 to 1962. His history, while deeply involved in promoting the sport, wasn't always great. And we knew that the BBWA was going to look at the names of some of the awards and they voted to remove the Kennesaw Mountain Landis name from the MVP award. And we're going to look at the Spink award. So I, you know, we, we had to have an opinion on it. So did a lot of research. I spent hours and days and weeks coming through the sporting news archives through the paper of record. And what I found was, was just not good. You know, the Spink's personal approach to baseball players who were not white was not great. His publications approach to them for decades was reprehensible. So I went into that research, quite honestly, not knowing what I was going to find. And within a a short amount of time, it was very clear that, you know, as we choose to move forward as a society, as a group, as people, we need to be better about who we're honoring and who we're, who is carrying our legacy. And, you know, as much as JD Taylor Spink did for the sporting news in some ways, he is not a, a person, a figure that we should be honoring uh, going forward. So I tried to, you know, present the case in, a, in an unbiased way and kind of laying out facts and laying, using a lot of direct quotes from the magazine from the 20s, 30s and 40s. And, and it was pretty clear that, you know, this was the direction we needed to go. So I wrote that up, presented it. And, you know, for the most part, it was received uh, as, as I had hoped so. Well, it was well done. And, you know, it's something about uh, understanding our history, but also advancing our industry and society. So appreciate your work. And then, you know, someone that that I don't know as well, but I certainly have read a ton of, and that is C. Trent Rosecrans. I'm really looking forward to talking to you as well. Read you for a long time, Cincinnati Inquirer and other coverage of the Reds. And now with 
uh, the athletic. And I, I have, uh, uh, you have a fan in me. I mean, that's for sure. I, I really appreciate your work, Trent. Uh, how are things going in Cincinnati? Oh, thank you. First and foremost, that's uh, very kind of you. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, besides calling us old, um, but Derek's <laughs> much, much older than I am. So that's, and I, I always have that, but uh, things are going well here, I guess. Um, you know, as well as anywhere, we're, I'm upright and that's where we start every day. And as long as I start upright, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, that's exactly right. That's how we want to start each day. Uh, you wrote a really fun piece about Joey Votto recently. <laughs> I want to get kind of get right into that. Um, Votto is an absolute character. I, I can't imagine covering someone like that. So before we <clears throat> talk about the Hall of Fame status of Joey Votto, and now we're going to get into that, but Tell me about Joey Votto. Like, what is that to cover somebody like that on basically a daily basis? Joe is uh, – my standard line is you can tell me anything about Joey Votto and I'll believe it. Um, <laughs> he is so – he is multi – he's, he's a I, – actually, I said this to Joey the other day um, when we were talking about something because um, he, he was talking about um, how he enjoys podcasts and listening to podcasts. And uh, that it's something he might be interested in at some point. He goes, but I'm really only, you know, I have expertise in one area. I was just like, my, my thing was like, Joey, I think you would be great because, well, he's really good at a lot of different things, but he's a genuinely curious person. And when you start there, I mean, I, I honestly, like that is my uh, creative process. So maybe I'm, uh, I'm, I'm patting myself on the back that, that, you know, I think that curiosity is key to what we do. Um, honestly, most of my best stories, and, and I try to write almost every story, um, starting with that, with that curiosity. Um, what do I not know? And what can I find out more? And in the end, if I don't find something interesting, how can I expect anybody else to find it interesting? Um, so that's kind of part of my creative process. But going back to Joey, Joey is a genuinely curious person. Um, he is also uh, very intelligent, both in a general sense and a um, and 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 in a baseball sense. And he's a guy that looks for more than he, he's nothing. He does is for surface, is for the surface. It's not a superficial. That's I guess the word I'm looking for. Um, you know, he is a guy who, because he grew up in Canada and Toronto, um, he has um, some he has some background in French. When Aroldis Chapman came to to um, the Reds, he wanted to learn Spanish so that he could um, relate to his new teammate, his new high profile profile teammate, and so he did that. And actually. Um, one of his minor league teammates and, and best friends is of Mexican descent from San Antonio or lives in San Antonio now, but from South Texas. And like, they had a, a joke and he grew up listening to Spanish and, you know, so he wanted Carlos to um, help him learn Spanish. And at some point he said it was within a year that like Joey was correcting his Spanish. Um, so that's just kind of the guy he is when, when the Reds signed Shogo Akiyama, he started taking Japanese lessons, um, and spring training in 2020, he had in his locker in spring training, it would open up and he had a cheat sheet of some Japanese phrases so that he could communicate <clears throat> with his new teammate teammate. And that's, uh, you know, that's a long way to give you a short answer that, Nothing about Joey Votto surprises me, and he's just an honestly um, curious person, and I, I find that fascinating. I remember was, the first time interviewing him, and uh, it was at the All-Star Game, one of the only times I've interviewed him, actually, and I found his answers, like he paused and really gave thought to the answer. I remember walking away from him like, wow, that was really different and kind of awesome. Like, I really enjoyed the conversation with him. Uh, I don't even remember what we talked about. It's been a while, but it was fascinating. It was about, you know, the, I think it was about the rivalry, the Cards Reds rivalry, and he kind of gave me some answers that I didn't anticipate. So it was good. Yeah, he's he's one of a kind and uh, has made my job easy. I don't know if I'm any good. It's just that Joey makes me better. <laughs> what do you think about him, Ryan? 
I said, Joey Votto is the reason I started bringing a second recorder to like the all-star game to the media day when they have all of these different players sitting at these different tables. I wanted to know what Joey Votto thought about whatever. And it didn't matter. I wasn't going to necessarily write about him, but I'd bring a second recorder. I'd set it down and I'd put it there and then I'd walk away and do my other interviews. And I would come back and listen to Joey Votto's interview. And I wouldn't even necessarily use anything, but it's a chance to, without shirking my other responsibilities of the day, to just listen to what he thinks and the way he approaches things. And some of the, the back and forth banter, I, you know, if, if somebody asks Joey Votto a, a goofy question, he'll tell you it's a goofy question, right? You know, so that back and forth was fun to see too. And, you know, the first all-star game I was at that he was there and I didn't have a second recorder. I was like, I'm not making that mistake again. If Joey Votto's around, I'm bringing a recorder so I can listen to that later. Once upon a time, Derek, I wondered how great of a Cardinal he would make. I don't think that would ever happen, but boy, what a player. I mean, I, I've enjoyed, there was a time where he was one of two or three best hitters in baseball. I mean, is he a first ballot hall of famer, Derek? That's a great question. Uh, you know, I, I wonder by the time when he comes up on the ballot, what the rest of that ballot looks like. I mean, at this moment, the timing might just be off for him for being a first ballot guy because he might retire at the same time that say a Scherzer or Verlander or Kershaw or some of the, you know, Pujols, some of these other guys. I mean, you look at that crowd that is going to retire at some point in time, say within the next five, six years, um, Posey, Molina, um, if they all retire at the same time, that ballot gets crowded. And one of the things that we see with voters is that they do compare and contrast, right? And we saw this probably, for St. Louis fans, probably most famously with um, with Edmonds and, and Griffey, and you know Trent knows that that well. Is is Griffey obviously was a surefire escort him to the Hall red carpet ride, first ballot Hall of Famer, first ballot Hall of Fame baseball card, first ballot Hall of Fame everything. Um, he was going there, but Edmonds was on that same ballot. And when you play the same position as the guy who is racing to Cooperstown and has all the support and is going to go in by acclamation, sometimes you get compared to that guy and you don't get the same amount of votes as maybe you would on another year. Um, it's, you know, we saw it also a little bit with Ted Simmons. Um, being compared to one of the best of all time always makes it difficult to get the support that you should. And so I think Vado's timing is going to be a very fascinating part of this, but because by any measure, um, he's ultimately a Hall of Famer. But if it's a first ballot Hall of Famer, I'm not sure. That's going to depend on the peers on that same sheet. Tim Raines is another one. He was always compared as like the second best leadoff hitter of all, you know, of his time. But it could have been of all time. Right. And then you got, uh, you know, like Dave Concepcion there in St. Louis or I'm sorry, in Cincinnati, where superb defensive shortstop who happened to play at the same time as Ozzie Smith. Right. I mean, there's other example or Alan Trammell, who is in the hall now, constantly getting par- compared to Cal Ripken Jr. Look, there's only one gold glove that goes out and there's only one all-star starter, you know, they're, they're, so if you start looking at those numbers to, to judge your hall of fame, Joey Votto overlapped with guys like Albert Pujols and Paul Goldschmidt at first base. So, you know, if he doesn't have the gold gloves that Paul Goldschmidt does, well, no kidding, but that doesn't make him less of a player. It makes him more remarkable. What's fascinating is Joey Votto does not have a silver slugger. Right. And that's that great. to me is an indictment on the silver slugger, not on Joey Votto. Yeah. Or the position that he played, right? Like, I mean, look right. at like the times that he would have been a silver slugger. It happened to be, oh, Albert Pujols or, you know, like, 2017 like, when you cost him the MVP. Um, what? He... <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I cost him the. Wait, no. What? I'm kidding. I'm what did I... I, thought that was... I thought it was Andrew McCutcheon. Or is it eight? No, no. It was. Or was it 18? No, it was 17. The 17 was um, John Carlos Stanton, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Where I went for the power home runs over the – Yeah, you know what, though? We... No, I'm kidding. You know, we had – honestly, like, it's just kind of a fun thing because Derek and I – I was at my daughter's soccer practice, and we talked for, like, an hour and a half. We did. And, um, and like, neither one of us was, like, advocating. Yeah. It wasn't like, it's funny when, when Derek and I talk about these things, we often have different perspectives, but I don't think either one of us is an advocate as much as a, we'll explain our positions and well, did you think of this? And 
most of the time I'll go, no, I didn't, Derek, you're right. And, um, and then like, well, what about this? And we go back. I mean, we had this discussion about relievers in the hall of fame yeah. um, in January or, or December. Um, just to, like, I don't know. I don't know if it was fun for Derek, but it was certainly fun for me. And it's um, fun for, I'll tell you what, it is fun <clears throat> for us following you both on Twitter. Cause you guys, the two of you have good interactions on Twitter. I think. Well, it, it honestly, it starts that I think we're very good friends. I hope, I hope so. I mean, despite the age difference, um, <laughs> I, think of it, I think of it more as mentor mentee. Cause I have the, what that's right. 30, 30 days on you, I think. So uh, I think 30 days in the job or no, no, you're like six months older than me. I'm not, I think I'm three months older than you, but it's a three big months. I mean, it was, it wasn't a pivotal months. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you I'm were alive player. for the 1975 world series. I was not, I was, that is correct. And so that gives me an edge, especially when it comes to Cincinnati, my, my Cincinnati cred is so much better because I saw the big red machine win that world series. And I, I will not argue that uh, you are much older than I. <laughs> let, let me ask Trent this one. Uh, Yachty is not popular in Cincinnati, but from, from your standpoint, uh, first ballot Hall of Famer? You know, I don't, I honestly don't make that first ballot distinction in my head. Um, to me, I, I mean, this could be misconstrued, but either you are or you aren't. And it's not, whether I've had you on my ballot. I mean, there are guys that I think are Hall of Famers that haven't made my ballot because I, you know, we're limited to 10. I don't know if Derek knows this um, about the rule of 10. <laughs> I know it's so well. I, I, <laughs> there will be a hundred inside jokes. So um, yes, uh, Derek, of course, did such great work trying to convince the Hall of Fame that uh, we should go to something that he termed the binary ballot as opposed to our limit of 10. Um, and I think that's a big part when you're talking about either guys like Joey Votto or Yachty yeah. or Molina. Um, what you've seen guys get bogged down in that rule of 10. I mean, to me, it, it's just, listen, this isn't a real tragedy or anything. And, and it, it, relative, let me put all the relative things on it. But it's unfathomable that Kenny Lofton was a one and done. Yep. Um, and I, I, it, yeah. And um, Edmonds is a guy who was on that border for me. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes those borders keep growing. And a lot of that was due to uh, the quote unquote steroid guys, you know, and that bog. And that is going to be cleared here pretty soon, uh, except for, well, A-Rod. And um, I think A-Rod will, will be the one who bogs it. But, but one of 10 as opposed to, well, two huge ones and then a bunch of others will always kind of murky the waters and make that voting tougher. Like, you know, I always thought that Edgar Martinez was a Hall of Famer, but it wasn't until a couple of ballots where I was able to check that box because I thought there were, because I do vote for Bonds and Clemens um, and, and some others so that I thought there were 10 players better than Edgar Martinez. He was my 11th for several years until he got cleared in. Um, you know and then on the other side larry walker i don't know if there was a bigger proponent of larry walker than i but um i, I know there are equals here on this call um but but yeah so anyway that's all kind of just a ramble uh to say yadier molina <laughs> well I, I think of you know something amir garrett said the other day um they don't vote they don't boo nobodies um and yadier molina gets booed every time he gets within the 513 area code um, and it's, it's because he's not a nobody. Um, he's a, he's a great player. And, um, it's always hard for me to have these hypothetical hall of fame, uh, discussions because of the homework that I do. Um, Derek, the same way. And I know this just because Derek and I have talked about our processes so much. I have actually, it sits on my desk at all time. This is my hall of fame notebook that I, that I keep year round and I go back to every late November, early December, December and go through it. And Derek and I spend, it, it, it's almost embarrassing how much time I spend on it. And I know Bear, Derek spends twice as much as I do. That's not the case. I spend um, twice as much time on the phone with you. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, 
And so, but the good news was I was walking that whole time. So it was good <laughs> exercise. Like seriously, it's no joke. I walked like 10 miles that day. It yeah. was, uh, it was a, it was a fun day uh, in, in many respects. Um, but, but, yeah. Sorry. Um, but Yadier Molina, I, I think he gets in um, first ballot. I don't know. And I don't really care when it is. I think ultimately when you're talking about something that lasts forever, um, do you care about one years or two years? I, I never make that distinction. I mean, Joe DiMaggio wasn't a first ballot hall of famer. So what are we even talking about? I mean, they don't no, that's, sign, that's they don't sign first ballot HOF when they sign a signature, they just sign HOF. So, you know, when you get, I mean, Tim Raines signs, Tim Raines HOF, and it was a long time coming, but you know what? There's partially like a greater appreciation for his career, you know, than, than maybe if he had, you know, gone right in right away, run away with it and it's gone straight in as a first ballot guy. I think, you know, another great example of that's going to be Scott Rowland when he goes in. Great and, point. and he's a guy that his appreciation for what he has done and, and quite honestly, um, Oh, um, why am I blanking on his name? Um, Burt Blylevin. Burt Blylevin. You know, yeah. I think we have a much greater appreciation because of that. Mm -hmm. um, and to not to jump on a future question, but honestly, I think Pete Rose, much of his appeal is that he is not in. And much yeah. of his marketability is that he is not in because that's what sets him apart. Is he so actually... obviously on the playing field worthy, but off the playing field he has done more than enough and you know what the heir to his throne Kurt Schilling I actually was going to ask you about that and and I'll have Ryan follow up from a national perspective but Trent what is what is sorry Pete Ryan Rose... I didn't mean to bulldoze you <laughs> no no, no but well like what is Pete Rose's um Trent what is Pete Rose's you know status right now in Cincinnati I mean has it ever changed no I mean and it doesn't matter the allegations of sex with underage girls uh he is still kind of the anti molina he's cheered every time he's comes in the 513 area code um so yeah uh he is it, it's it's a topic that is ne it's an evergreen topic in this city um you know as a as a city that has a reputation for uh being a little um you know provincial uh he is the ultimate provincial um uh he's the ultimate hometown boy i mean he's as derided outside this this city as skyline chili and beloved inside it as much as skyline chili um which is actually really delicious it's not like that that thing you call pizza <laughs> oh i knew that was gonna come in somehow uh ryan what about what uh, skyline uh, chili man why you gotta go there that's no <laughs> Yeah, Skyline Chili, and no no shots at Provel, please. This is a no no Provel uh, ripping zone here. Uh, Ryan, what about what about the Hall of Fame from your perspective? How do you see all that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting that we, we bring up you know Scott Rowland because he was a guy when we talk about the ten the ten player ballot when he first his first year on the ballot. I mean, when I cast my when I mailed the ballot when I finally filled it out, it was December thirtieth. December thirty first was the the deadline. He was trending on the, uh, the tracker that's publicized on Twitter. He was right about eight and a half, nine percent. And Johan Santana was about three and a half percent. And I used, even though if I'm ranking my top candidates from one to 15, Roland and Santana were not in the top 10. But because of the way the ballot is set up, it's, it was important to me that those guys find a place and stick around and stay in the conversation because of Lofton and Edmonds, and Simmons and and all of these other, this list of great, great players who were just gone in an instant. Um, Roland wound up at about 10%, I think, that first year on the ballot. And then once it cleared up, you know, I mean, he jumped to 30%. What was he, 50%, something like that this year? And I find, I think he's getting the, the credit that he deserves. Um, that that 10-person ballot in certain years is, is a lot of trouble. You know, I've voted five times now, and it's been – it's been difficult to figure out not just who are the 10 guys, but how am I going to best, how am I going to best use my 10 votes? Because that's a different question. And so I voted for guys like that. I voted this last year, even though I don't necessarily think that Mark Burley and Tim Hudson 
are going to wind up in Cooperstown. I think they deserve to be in that conversation. So I did put them on the ballot. And, you know, there are a lot of people that, you know, kind of laughed at me and said, what are you doing? But it's kind of the philosophy that I've used every year. And, and it really is, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, when Trent said, you, you can't talk about like hypotheticals in the same way you can talk about the actual vote that you cast. That's so true. You know, when you have it, and, and even at the end of the year, MVP Cy Young, you know, you're putting hours and hours and days in, in talking to people. You're doing all this research, all this legwork. But if we're talking about who's the Cy Young favorite in 2021, I'm going to look at a couple numbers and write something and it's going to be a lot different. And that's kind of the case, you know, with, with Vado and Molina, especially in their Hall of Fame candidacies, even though they're farther down the road than we are in a yearly ward in, you know, in the beginning of June, you know, it, it is a little bit different. And it's fun to talk about. It's fun to have the conversations and conversations now help form opinions, help at, raise questions that we go in and we'll research. And so when we do have a final vote, then, you know, we're, we're better informed, but, you know, the hall has been, um, it's, it's been the, the coolest thing that I've gotten to do in my career. And it's been maybe the most stressful thing that I've gotten to do in my career, but that's because there's so much attached to it. And it's such a, a cool thing to be a part of. Well, you don't have an easy job and I, I do appreciate all that you do. There's no doubt about it. All three of you. Uh, let me ask this. So as we're taping this, we're a third of the way through the season and it is on in the NL central, the Cubs lead the division by a half game. The Cardinals are in second. The Brewers are not going away. They've won five in a row. They're back in it at a game and a half out. The Reds are five and a half out. I'm still wondering. I think they should be better than they are. But anyway, we'll, we'll ask Trent about that. But Derek, let me get your read on the division right now. Is this uh, what you envisioned here at this point? Yeah, I, the four teams kind of being in the mix, you know, like you said, the Reds being a little further back is a bit of a surprise, but that's not anything they can overcome because of the flaws the other team had. It's, it's sort of a case where the division race will be who gets healthier, who stays healthier, and who has the fewest, biggest flaws and who can overcome them. I mean, it's somewhat uh, uh, different than, say, like the West, right? Like I'm out in Los Angeles here having seen the Diamondbacks um, came out here earlier to see the Cardinals versus San Diego. And, you know, in the NL West, I mean, it's like, it, it, you know, it's a race of, for power. Um, it's the Padres and the Dodgers and it's who can play the game better, who can have a brawnier um, lineup, who can have a better pitching staff in the NL central. It's who can have depth to survive. It's, it's a little bit, you know, different that the, the race is just geared differently. It's, it's more of a, uh, less of a show of force and more of a marathon of attrition and who, who doesn't fall off the pace. Um, you know, the Cardinals need more pitching and they need better pitching and the Brewers have pitching, um, you know, and the Cubs are the Cubs. I said on a Chicago radio station the other day, and I think I got kind of skewered for it, but I kind of stand by it that like the Brewers and the Cardinals have the rosters to win the division the Cubs have the roster to catch the title if those other two teams fall. Mm, I, uh, that's kind of the way I saw it to, to start the year. I thought it would be a Cards Brewers battle. I really did. I think you picked the Brewers to win it, didn't you? I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Well, I followed the pitching. You know, I mean, that's my rule of yep. thumb. I don't. You know, I mean, look, predictions are wrong the moment you put them in the paper. Um, but if I'm going to have some kind of consistency, whether like Trent and I actually talk about this a lot, you know, I want to try to have some consistency year to year with my Hall of Fame ballot. I want to have consistency year to year with my MVP ballot. I don't want to, you know, go with the, the trade wins that year and say, oh, well, this feels right. I want year to year to year to have some kind of guideposts or something that I can grab onto and say, okay, this is how I'm going to make my decision. Now, same thing with predictions. Every year we're asked to do those predictions. And my rule of thumb is follow the pitching. Where is the best pitching? Where is the deepest pitching? And to be honest, you know, the Cardinals left spring training with Miles Michaelis as a question. You know, Gung Young Kim is a question. Um, they were scrambling the bullpen to create more starters, um, whereas the Brewers started it with the guys that you're seeing now. They just had better pitching. So I followed the pitching. How do you see it, Trent? How do you see the Reds uh, and the rest of the NL Central right now? Yeah, none of them are any good. That's the first <laughs> part I go. I mean, that's what I, Derek was trying to say. Um, none of them are any good except for the Pirates who are awful. Um, so, you know, I, I think when you look at the rosters, the Brewers are probably the team that I think have the best roster. 
Um, have they played the best? No. Um, you know, and you go to the pitching, there's so many things with the Reds that have kind of, I mean, basically if Luis Castillo were 75% of what Luis Castillo could be, you'd feel a lot better about this team. Um, where he is right now is a big part of this. And also kind of some of those bullpen pieces have just not performed. Amir Garrett, Lucas Sims, um, you know, nobody has better stuff than Lucas Sims, but he's had a couple of bad outings. Um, that, you know, they have found TJ Antone is kind of their right-handed um, version of, um, God, I'm terrible with like recalling names real quick because um, I'm like, oh, Josh Hader. Um, so, you know, he's kind of a right-handed Josh Hader type. And, you know, so they have some of those weapons. Wade Miley has been, you know, traditional Wade Miley, not the injured version we saw last year. Sonny Gray's coming back. Um, so if, if Luis Castillo were anywhere near what you expect out of Luis Castillo, then I think you feel a lot better about this team. You know, right now, you, <laughs> I, I dare you to find two offensive players playing better than Jesse Winker and Nick Castellanos. Um, but the rest of them have struggled and you have... Mike Moustakis, Joey Votto, Nick Senzel, all on the injured list right now. Um, so that is kind of a pretty big issue with this team. But yet, you know, they're okay. I mean, they're okay. And like they're, they're, they're a four out of 10 or four out, five out of 10. But I don't see anybody in this division being more than a six or a seven, you know, and seven at the best. Um, I don't see anybody right now more than a five. So, yeah, they could they could challenge because nobody's running away with it because none of these teams are any good. Like anybody can take this, maybe Ryan, but what about the deadline? I mean, could one of these or more than one of these teams get aggressive? Well, I think so. I, I think, you know, what we've kind of touched on is there, there's a difference between the, the goal, right? If you're an NL West team and you want to win the division, you're thinking you've got to get to 103 wins, maybe 104 in the NL Central, I mean, it's a race to 90, 92 wins at most probably is going to win that division. And the difference between, let's be honest, the difference between 89 wins and 92 wins in a 162-game season is not a lot. You know, it's it's a bloop here, a, a, you know, a pass ball here. It changes a lot of things. And so those teams are going to stay in there. The question is, is what's the motivation and then what's the cost when we're looking at the trade deadline? You know, who's willing to go out? Is someone going to go out and get a big time player? Are they going to trade a big prospect to bring people in? Or are they going to go out and try to get a couple of little pieces here, maybe a fourth starter, a second lefty in the bullpen? You know, these are the, the questions that they're going to be asking. The teams are going to be asking themselves over the next um, next month or two. And because, you know, it's just, it's it's not a race to 105. It's a race to 90. That's, that's a lot different. And you don't necessarily feel the motivation to go out and get these big, these big time additions at the, at the trade deadline, if you're not trying to get there. And if you also don't legitimately think you can win a world series, you know, and that's something they have to ask too. And that's, that's going to kind of guide what they do leading up to and at the trade deadline. Right. Ryan, are you saying that it could be, that it all could come down to a bases loaded walk or. <laughs> the, the shrimp alert. Yeah. It, it could, it could come down to something like that. Absolutely. I think what's more interesting and, and, and is going to be who's aggressive selling. Yeah. Um, that could be the Cubs or the Reds. I don't know. Right. If I see the Brewers or, or the, the Cardinals really doing that, but, but you have those two teams that could say, all right, we're, we're done. And, and especially it's, it, it might even be easier for the Cubs mm -hmm. because they have won a world series recently and they have had some success and you say, Oh, this is near the end. Um, for, for a lot of this, Chris Bryant and, and Javi Baez being um, free agents, you know, they haven't developed pitching really well. So it could be the time that they, you know, they just back off and, and sell off and say, hey, we're not going to win the World Series with this roster. We've got to do something and let's sell off some big pieces to help so one of those other teams that's going to make a big move. Are we the trading partner for the big move that we restock? Um, and then, you know, the Reds, a guy like Nick, Nick Castellanos, um, he has an opt out after this season mm -hmm. and he didn't, he had one after last season too, but he did not perform well enough. If he continues to do what he is do doing right now. And, and, you know, I don't know that another two months playing relatively close to what he has the first two months is out of the question. If he does that, well, 
he's priced himself out of being a long-term red because he can go back on the market. And, you know, they broke the bank two years ago when, when they signed a bunch of players, including Nick Castellanos and Mike Moustakas. Um, I don't see them doing that again with where they are. So do they go out and say, hey, you want a guy who can change? Look what he did in Chicago a couple of years ago when he came over at the deadline. And look at how he's mashing right now. We can try to get something back. I mean, traditionally, position players haven't gotten as much at the deadline as, as pitchers, but you have that possibility there. I really maybe even Luis Castillo. I really wonder where that line is for the Cubs. That, that is one of the more in, increasingly interesting subplots to this season is if they're two games out, if they're a half game out, but they go, wait a minute, our future really could use a quick reboot and the market is right to, to get a big return on guys, sort of what like the Yankees got from the Cubs. When you think back to that point, I, I really wonder where the Cubs line is. And I, I think as of right now, it's a bit of a moving target because so are their ticket sales, you know, as the ballpark starts to open back up and, as people start to buy tickets and fill Wrigley for both the experience, but also maybe to see a first place team, does that change their flexibility and what they can do in the standings um, and how quickly they jump away from this core. And that's, that's the fascinating thing is I, I just wonder how, where the level of patience is and where that line is for the front office to walk away from the dynasty that wasn't and get a head start on the next team. Well, we hope you're enjoying Ball Talk from the St. Louis chapter of the Baseball Writers Association of America. And thank you to all of you who have subscribed already. Subscriptions are really great because all of the money goes to fund scholarships to take care of these young writers moving forward. And we thank you so much for them. The donation, $3 for a single episode. It's $12 for a half season and 20 bucks for the full subscription of 16 episodes of Ball Talk. Uh, before we go, in the interest of time, you know, the reason that uh, we cover things is our love for journalism, for sure. But also, you know, if you're covering this game, you have a love and appreciation for the game. And how did that start? I think for the four of us, we do have something in common is that part of our love for the game growing up was baseball cards. Um, and certainly, Ryan, following you on social media and your dive into baseball cards almost on a daily basis has been really fun. How did that start for you? And I'll let you all chime in about your love for, uh, for cards. Well, I mean, it, it started back with the 1987 top set, you know, riding the bike up to the gas station or uh, the Ben Franklin, you know, was a, a little bit longer bike ride, but I'd go up there and you try to balance the box of baseball cards on the, on the bike handlebars and I'm um, going up and down Hills. And you know, it's just, it, it was such a part of growing up, you know, every time you get a new set, you see a new player, you know, I remember one time, you know, I was riding my bike and I had a box of 87 tops that I just opened at my buddy's house and around the corner of this little dachshund dog named Schnitzel ran out and spooked me and I dropped my cards into the snow. And there were three Tom Morrell rookie cards in there. And I was so oh, mad at that dog. And I asked my mom, can we go and like punish the dog? And she just looked at me like, no, they're baseball cards. You're fine. So, I mean, that's, that's, that, that's where it started. Um, last February, I happened to have bought a couple of packs, 91 upper deck. And I posted, I, I found a pack that had a lot of players and I thought, Hey, I've got stories about a lot of these guys. I bet people on Twitter do too. So I just laid them out on the, on the table, took a picture and just said, tell me your favorite story about one of these players. And instantly the responses chimed in and it wasn't about, I mean, there was a Griffey jr. In the pack. Nobody talked about Griffey jr. There was a Milt Thompson in the pack. Lots of people talked about Milt Thompson the time that he gave him uh, an autograph at a card show at the time he was nice to them at the ballpark. And it was all these stories. <laughs> there we go. The, right. the, the, the DG cards, you know, and it was all these stories that, that, that were about nostalgia and this connection to the players and the sport, you know, so that kind of started the pack of the day thing. And I've done it most days since then. And, and it's, it's become just a, a nice little bright spot for me on Twitter. Selfishly, it's been a bright spot for me. Um, and I think a lot of people have enjoyed it as well. I've loved your coverage, Ryan, and you. you know your recent story about some of the boom and all this. And and you're right. I mean, it goes back. I don't. I don't know when I fell in love with baseball. I always say like, I, I've, it, it's like when I fell in love with breathing. I, I don't remember that. Um, it's just always been a part of my life. It really has. Um, I do remember going to my grandmother's 
in uh, California, Missouri in 1981, um, going to Cal's, which was the uh, local uh, grocery store. And she would always give me 25, 50 cents, whatever it cost to buy a pack of cards. So I have a ton of 81 tops, which is like the most nondescript series ever. Um, it's like a has that stupid hat that has the team name printed on it instead of a real, real like hat. And it's like just the, but that summer, I just have all these 81 tops and they always mean something to me because it's right before we moved. Um, so I was at my parents in, in California, Missouri. Um, so it was, uh, it, it's crazy. And like this last year has been odd um, because like those, those Gould uh, cards that I said, you know, last year I went trying to find those because it's, it's more fun if you like pull it in a, in a pack. The, the cool chase card? Yeah, the cool chase card. Like the chase is the fun. Um, mm -hmm. I've always had a collector's mentality. So it's like more about the hunt than than the having. Um, but like trying to find the Allen and Genters from last year in, you know, December or whenever they came out, November, it was nigh on impossible. Mm -hmm. And um, it's taken a lot of the fun out of it. Um, but I also, you know, the, the Tops uh, Project 2020, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I have a ton of them right here. Um, they're all the same card because it's the card I obsessed it with as over a child. But, you know, I have a lot of these mm. um, because here is, you know, my childhood card. The one, oh, well, no, it's over here somewhere. Anyway, so that was fun. And yeah, you know what? I'm one of those people. I sold a card for $500 because I could. Um, so I'm one of those people. But yes, this is my, this is the card I grew up like obsessing over and I got this for I think my 11th birthday and uh still here that's a, that's a sweet card I'm a little jealous I'm not gonna lie yeah I got all the ones that they did or not I didn't get all of them I only got the ones that spoke to me and then I found out the first one I got was I didn't really like and it was going for five six hundred dollars so I sold it I, uh, so I I 1984 you guys talk about the cards that made I guess is the phrase, right? The cards that made you. So the 1984 Don Manley card, I remember getting that card. And, you know, um, I mean, it just, it's got the, 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 the profile pick, but then it has him in his crouch at first base. Um, and I just remember getting that card and tumbling into baseball cards. And then, you know, came the wood panel tops and the future stars and racing after the Bo Jackson cards. And then, uh, you know, I, I, my, uh, my time with baseball it really started with a fondness for the game and playing the game. Um, but then my connection to baseball without a team in the time zone was through newspapers and baseball cards. That's all I had. Like I, we didn't have cable TV when I was a kid, so I didn't have access to even watching all that many games unless it was on Saturday or unless, and I did pull this off. Sometimes I could volunteer to babysit on Sunday night just to watch the game for for somebody who had cable that was actually a question i would ask like derek can you baby don't say night do you have cable i <laughs> was my, my way of getting baseball so baseball cards um and the and the newspaper were my connection to the game um i uh i will i'll, I'll tell two quick bookend stories that you know kind of capture why i adore baseball cards and also just why i think baseball means so much to me is um, Pearl Street Mall is a pedestrian mall in Boulder. Um, I would go down there and busk. I would play Christmas carols and um, stuff like that with my violin. And you'd open up the case and you'd get coins and dollar bills and everything to throw in there. Well, I would always try to position myself by, from Boulder base, right in front of Boulder baseball cards, because that's where I was going to spend the money anyway. So it was a shorter walk. Um, so I would get the money there. Um, fast forward now, you, you know, Trent, was talking about the Allen and Ginter set and it is a remarkable honor that tops stuffed me in the card to disappoint kids everywhere when they pulled. Um, but there were two kids in Colorado who went to a target um, right there, you know, whatever, 12 minutes from where I used to busk um, five minutes from where I grew up and they bought two packs and they opened the packs and kid opened up one pack. And there, my card was up top. The, you know, his his sibling was jealous and frustrated, and she opened up her pack, and my card was in there, and they were thrilled. And these were the two kids of two of my best friends from high school who just bought the packs 
off the rack and uh, and had this surprise to see a face that they knew well, um, you know, who they had seen writing stories at their dining room, dining room table um, on deadline a few times um, in a, in a card pack. It just it was it's it's awesome. Um, it's so such a cool honor. Um, a quick third story. One of the neatest things is the letters that I get. Like I'll get people sending me the card to sign and I'll get letters from English teachers and from teachers and from baseball fans and baseball collectors. But I've gotten a few from teachers that have uh, given the card as an award um, for writing, which, you know, just to, to their kids to say, Hey, look, there's, there's another way to get a card here. You, you can be a writer and get a baseball card, um, which is something that if you had told me at that age, I would have, would have blown my mind. If you had told Trent at a younger age, it would have blown his mind, you know, because he's young. Much. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I can't even imagine. I, for me, riding my bike like Ryan up to, to pair hobby shop uh, yeah. and, you know, getting a couple, yeah. couple packs of baseball cards. And I actually had a stack sitting here because I interviewed uh, former Cardinals Dave LaPointe and John Costello, a couple of buddies of mine. And LaPointe was upset that I didn't have any Cardinals uh, of him. He played for like, you know, a dozen different teams, but there were no Cardinals. I said, I probably traded it, uh, but like <laughs> I saw, I saw this. So like you have, it Those might be great strange. Cards. Yeah. So that, that was kind of the year. So the 86, mm -hmm. that's a Dave LaPointe, but then look at this 86, there's LaPointe again. That's because it's a tops traded. The traded set. So um, he was. That traded set has the Bo Jackson, which is slightly oh. more. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> than the Dave LaPointe, but. <laughs> Here's 87. I, I keep. An That's unopened the, pack just for fun because you yeah, don't know. The point. There's an so 87 Trent, point. Yeah. That's nice. Hey, so Trent has showed the, the so I have one baseball card. Well, people send me a lot of Robin Ventura cards. And Ryan Fagan was nice enough to give me a whole stack. Of, I've got like uh, 10 more that I found since then. So can't wait. <laughs> I'll, I'll take them. Uh, but uh I uh I, I don't have I only have one baseball card on my desk. Like if if I were home, I would I would grab I well that's not, I have two. I have one of my son. And, but I only have one Topps baseball card on my desk. And uh, this will be trivia perfect for Ryan. You ready for it, Ryan? Yeah. So I have the 1970 Kurt Flood at my desk. Do you, do you have any guess why? Uh, well, I mean, obviously Kurt Flood had a big impact on the game, but I'm yeah. guessing it's probably more than that. No, it's it, it's representative of the impact that he had on the game. Yeah, it's okay. a Phillies card. Yeah. No, he Kurt was Flood, yeah. Phillies, a team he never played a day for. Wow. And because he never played a day for it, you know, the, the world changed. Um, I, I, that car, it cost me like maybe 35 cents to get. Um, but I, it's got it to me. It's like, why is this car not worth more money? It's like, it's not, I mean, he was traded to the Phillies, but the fact that he never played there is everything. And the Supreme court, had to rule on it and free agency followed and everything and yeah that's that i keep that card on my on my desk yeah i'm, I'm absolutely gonna go find one and steal that and use it for my card of the day one day one day coming up <laughs> there you go so get that's right <laughs> let's, let's drive better, up the price of it yeah, i know i was gonna go. say i better i, I better just bid a one. dollar <laughs> <laughs> i better go get one before that price goes up um well i, I appreciate you guys and before we go uh we, we want to remind you a couple of things. So we're doing this all season, gearing up for the Baseball Writers Dinner in January. Uh, we're raising money, uh, donations for scholarships, and we have so many great recipients of those scholarships through the years. Uh, you can also look at clips from the past eight years of the dinner, a very well-attended dinner here in St. Louis. The St. Louis BBWAA YouTube channel has them. You just search St. Louis Baseball Writers Association, and you'll see great clips like this one. The Cardinals miss... Uh, Lou Brock and Bob Gibson, uh, each who passed away last year, and they are commemorating uh, those two players. And right now, commemorating Gibson wearing 45 on their sleeve. This is from 2018. This is the Baseball Writers Dinner here in St. Louis when they honored Bob Gibson with the Red Shandings Medal for invaluable service to the game of baseball. So let's go into the archives and go back to that night. This is Rick Hummel's introduction and Ricky Horton's interview with Bob Gibson. Bob Gibson was so invaluable to baseball, they changed the rules because of what he did in 1968. The Hall of Famer played his entire career in 1959 and 1975 with the Cardinals, said club records 
for games won at 251, I get this now, complete games at 255, let alone 56 shutouts, 3,173 strikeouts. 14 straight double-figure win seasons, including five of 20, two of 19, another of 18. But he was so good in 1968 that baseball had to alter its rules. 50 years ago, Gibson compiled a modern-day best earned run average of 1.12 while winning 22 games, throwing 13 shutouts. He led a, a parade of pitching dominance in baseball, and for 1969, the height of the mound was lowered by a stunning 33% from 15 inches to 10. Pissed me off, Gibson said then. <laughs> and now. <laughs> but it didn't seem to matter that year to him in 1969. He was still 20 and 13, 218 ERA, 314 innings, nine more than he had the previous year, and striking out 269, one more than he had the previous year. He had 28 complete games in both those seasons. 1968, Bob Gibson had five consecutive shutouts before giving it up an earned run on what scored a wild pitch in the first inning of a 5-1 to one win at Dodger Stadium. He then threw another shutout in San Francisco in his next outing. Recently, Bob said, in those days when Red came to the mound and asked me how I was feeling, I said, who's down there in the bullpen? If Gibson didn't like the answer, which was often the case, he would tell Shane Deans, I'm fine. His piece de resistance came in the first game of the 1968 World Series when he struck out a record still standing 17 Detroit Tigers. The winner of the, win of the writer's prestigious red medal, 45, Bob Gibson. Think back at that uh, 1968 season in particular, 1.12 ERA, the lowest ERA uh, by far of any major league pitcher uh, from 1920 and beyond. Dwight Goodens was in the 1.5s, he's second. Uh, Unbelievable year for you. All of the shutouts, everything working. Uh, and then as John uh, said and Rick said, uh, the mound has changed. Did it really make you mad the following year after they <laughs> lowered the mound? Oh, everything made me mad. You know, I, <laughs> I was, uh, I, I pitched every game with, with knots in my stomach because uh, that year we, we just didn't score a lot of runs. We, you'd win two to one, or if you gave up uh, two runs, you would lose. And so uh, I'd start the game not wanting to give up a hit, not wanting to give up a run. And uh, it, it was a tough way to, to go through the season. Uh, of course, I enjoyed the game, so I endured it. But I was, I was just kind of ticked off most of the time. And they says, ah, he's pitching like he's mad. Well, I was mad. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that because your guy likes to have fun, but clearly, you know, I'm afraid of you, as most people are that know you. So, no, but, but, but is there a, there's a balance there, though, as a, as a competitive athlete of enjoying what you do, but also playing with some fire. Well, you know, I, uh, I've heard that pretty much all my life about people being afraid of me and this and that. But I, I, I fear does not necessarily come from me. It comes within you. And if that's the way you see me, then all right, let's go for it. <laughs> you know, and I didn't, I didn't realize until I got through pretty much all of my career before I knew that, that the, the other team saw me that way. Mm -hmm. And if I had known that, I'd have been a lot nastier than I was. <laughs> you, um, well, we talked about it before. You didn't really hit very many people. Everybody thinks you did. Well, I did hit guys. Um, not necessarily throwing at them. But I, I pitched inside, and they knew I was going to pitch inside. And the, the problem with pitching in there, it, those big hitters, strong hitters, like to get their arms out. They like the ball out over the plate. And if they're looking outside, and you throw the ball inside, and you got a little bit of giddy up on it, they might hit themselves. Yeah. So they hit themselves. I see. Yes. So you didn't hit anybody. They hit themselves. They hit themselves. And that's your story. So, and I'm sticking to it. And you're it. sticking to it. A look back at the archives and our thanks to the Commish and Ricky Horton for that presentation and interview from the 2018 Baseball Writers Dinner. You can uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to this podcast. You can follow along on Facebook, St. Louis Baseball Writers, and on Twitter, where it's St. Louis BBWAA. And always use the hashtag STL Ball Talk to ask a few questions and we'll get to them. Our next one's going to be on June 
19th. That'll when the will drop Friday, June 19th. So the Cardinals will be playing the Braves at that time and then staying on the road and going to take on the Detroit Tigers. So we'll see what fascinating things happen. What that's well, right after the Cardinals go full capacity of our stadium also. Well, our thanks to Trent Rosecrans from Cincinnati. Enjoyed that very much. Thanks for being with us. Thanks to Ryan Fagan from the Sporting News. A great pleasure. And of course, Derek Gould, thanks for all that you do for the St. Louis chapter of the Baseball Writers Association of America. And thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Appreciate it. Enjoy our thanks. appreciation to Steve Pona and our production crew. I'm Tom Ackerman. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next episode on Friday, June 19th.